وسلم, his method in correcting people's mistakes. Of the most important qualities that a person can have, and we're going to go through a lot of qualities actually, but of the most important qualities that a person can have, number one, is to have sincerity. Recognizing that every action that we do, if it is not sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it will be rejected. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, why is it that I am doing this? Why is it that I am correcting this person? Why is it that I am engaging this person? Why is it that I am calling this person to Islam? Or why is it, why is it that I am speaking? Why is it that I'm teaching? Why are we doing all of these things? Because of the importance of sincerity, we know that for an action to be accepted, it must fulfill two requirements. The first is that it has to be sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the second is that it has to be done in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu But sincerity is that first ingredient. Sincerity is that first requirement. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he tells us in a very profound hadith of the Prophet sallallahu he says that Rasulullah sallallahu said that on the day of judgment, the first group of people that the fire will be kindled by, the first people that the fire will be kindled by are three categories of people or three groups of people. The first, he says, is the scholar or the qari, the person who is the reciter of the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring that person forth and he'll mention to him all of his blessings that he's given that person. And that person won't deny any of them. And then Allah will say to them, what did you do with those blessings? And the man will say, I taught your book. Now normally, the person who's the teacher of the book is the best of the people. The Prophet ﷺ says in the famous hadith of Uthman bin Affan, خيركم من تعلم القرآن وعلمه. The best of you are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it. That person is normally the best in any community, in any ummah. That person would be the best on the Day of Judgment. And yet, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that this is one of the people whom the fire will be kindled with on the Day of Judgment. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that, that person says to Allah, what I did with your blessings is that I taught your book, Allah will say to him, you lied. And the angels will say, you lied. You did it so that the people could say that you are a qari. Or you did it so that the people can say that you are a alim. And it was said. And it was said. Meaning you got what you wanted. In the dunya, you got preferential treatment, you got a whole lot of respect, your ego was stroked every day of your life. You got it. And then that person will be commanded to be dragged on their face into the hellfire. And then another person, the second person who will be brought forth is a person who was a jawad, someone who was very generous, someone who parted frequently with something that is made very desirable to people, which is wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call forward that person and he'll recount to him his blessings and the man won't deny any of them. And then he'll say, what did you do with these blessings? He'll say, I didn't find a path in your way except that I spent. They needed an Islamic school, I supported the Islamic school. They wanted to build the masjid, I built the masjid. They wanted this organization and that organization needed assistance this cause and that relief agency. I didn't find a cause except that I spent in your way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then say, you lied. And again, remember that the person who gives in the path of Allah, Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu purchased paradise twice. The first time when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, who will purchase the well of Ru'ma? Who will purchase the well of Ru'ma? And they will have paradise because it was a well that the Muslims needed. And there was a Jewish man in Medina who had the prices very, very high. And so Uthman ibn Affan came to purchase that well from him to bring relief to the Muslims. And the man said, no, I'm not going to sell you my cash cow. And so Uthman radiallahu anhu said, okay, well then we'll go half. You purchase the well. 
or we'll split so that I get the well on some days. The revenue from the well goes to me. And you get the well on some days. The revenue goes to you. The man agreed to that. Uthman made him an offer that he couldn't refuse. And so what did Uthman do? On the day that was his, it was free. And so the Muslims would stockpile on the day of Uthman. And on the day of the other man, they wouldn't get anything. And so this man's revenue dried up. And so he sold the rest of the well to Uthman anhu as well. Uthman says, I purchased paradise twice. The second time was the Prophet وسلم, fundraising for Jaysh al-Usra. Jaysh al-Usra was an army of such incredible hardship, the, the campaign of Tabuk. It was during the time of, of, of the summer heat, which was also the time of harvest. And so there was the fatigue of going out in the heat. And at the same time, there was the loss of wealth of going out when the Ansar were farmers and this was the time for them to reap the benefits of their farming. And so the Prophet ﷺ was fundraising for this army and Uthman who says, O oh Messenger of Allah, I am going to finance 100 soldiers with their horses, with their cavalry, with, with their weaponry rather. I'm going to fundraise that. I'm going to finance that. And so the Prophet him accepts from him and he continues to fundraise. And then Uthman says, Ya Rasulullah, 200. And the Prophet accepts from him and he continues to fundraise. And then Uthman anhu says, O Messenger of Allah, 300. And what I love about this hadith or this incident is that it's very human. When we go to a fundraiser, you may come, it's a fundraiser that's outside, or maybe if it's a fundraiser in the masjid on the 27th night of Ramadan or something like that, you know, you're walking into a fundraiser, you know there's going to be a fundraiser. You, you walk in with a ceiling that you're comfortable with. You walk in knowing that, you know what, I can donate $100 or I can donate $1,000 or I can donate $500. This is what I'm comfortable donating. And so Uthman starts off with what he's comfortable with, 100 but then as the night goes on, he didn't shut off his mind and say, you know what, I participated, falas. He challenges himself. And he says, you know what, well maybe I can do 200. Maybe it'll be a pinch, but maybe I can maneuver this bill around here. Maybe I can maneuver this payment around here. Maybe I can collect money from this person here that's owed to me. I don't know, I can figure it out. Maybe I can borrow money from this person. I can do 200. And then he's continuing to challenge himself and then he says eventually 300. And so when he goes back home and he brings his gold, he comes and he pours it onto the lap of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes a statement that is worth more than anything Uthman ever donated. He says, مَا ضَرَّ Uthman, مَا فَعَلَ بَعْدَ الْيَوم Uthman will not be harmed by anything that he does after today. So the person who spends in the path of Allah, but this person on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to him, كذبت. You lied. You did it so that the people could say that he is generous. And it was said, you got your name on the room of the classroom that you built at the Islamic school, you got your plaque on the wall of the masjid as a, as a thanks. Everywhere you go, you always get that VIP treatment, hugs and thanks and respect because of the money that you donated. You know, I know in one masjid, a brother donated $15,000 to the masjid. And so, this is a masjid very far away from here. But the brother donated $15,000. And then he came to the masjid on one day at Jum'an. The guy just parked in the handicap parking like he owned the place. And so people told him, the brothers who are out on the street, I believe it was for Jum'ah, so you have all of these people outside maneuvering cars and things like that, valeting. And they asked him again and again, can you please move your car? It's not supposed to be here. Or maybe it was some sort of violation for their parking lot or what have you. And the man just knows, and he walks into the masjid and 
And so they go and they complain to the president of the board. And the president of the board, he then goes and calls this man. And the man's giving him all sorts of attitude. Very, very disrespectful. And so finally he calls him into the, to, into the office. And he says to him, listen man. If you're acting like this because you donated $15,000 for the masjid, here's your check. We'll give it right back to you. This isn't, this isn't your, your house. This isn't a country club. That now you can do whatever you want. If you donate, you make sure that you do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only for Allah. You're not doing it to get anything from that person. You're not doing it to get anything from that organization. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to them, you lied. And then he commands for that person to be dragged on their face into the hellfire. Number three, the third person is a person who gave more than, or he gave more than, he gave the most that he could give. That person gave his life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to him, his blessings, will recount them to him, and then he'll say, what did you do with them? And the man will say, I gave my life in your path. And Allah will say to him, Kadab, you lied. You did it so that the people could say you are brave. And it was said. And if you notice in all three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and it was said. You got what you wanted. The people praised you. The people respected you. The people made poems about you. The people recited your praise in their collective memory. And you got what you wanted. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ أَرَادَ الْعَاجِلَ عَجَّلْنَا لَهُ فِيهَا مَا نَشَاءُ لِمَنْ نُرِيدُ Allah says, whoever wishes for the ajila, whoever wants this world, عَجَّلْنَا لَهُ فِيهَا مَا نَشَاءُ We will give them a portion of what we wish. Not what they wish. They wanted to be a billionaire, they only got to be a millionaire. You don't get everything that you want out of this dunya. You wanted this and you only got that. But you got a portion of what you wanted. Allah says, For whoever we wish. Whoever made the dunya their, their goal and their concern. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We give them a portion of what they wanted for whoever we wish. And then we provide them with Jahannam, Yaslaha, Madmum, and Madhura. They will enter into Jahannam humiliated. And whoever desires the hereafter. And strives for the hereafter as it deserves to be striven for. Because it's not just a matter of wishful thinking. That I want the akhirah, I want to be in Jannah, I want to be in the highest place in paradise. Allah says, whoever wants the hereafter, but wanting it, desiring it, isn't enough. وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعِيَهَا They work for it. As it deserves to be worked for. وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ And they have faith. Those are the two requirements. Having faith and righteous deeds. Having faith and working towards it. فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا And whoever does that, then that person's journey is going to be appreciated. And so these three people, what caused them to enter into the hellfire when normally they would have been the best and in the highest places in paradise? Their intention. And so the first thing that a person has to make sure that they constantly engage and constantly reflect on is their intention. Sufyan al -Thawri, who was the first person to be called Amir al-Mu'minin fil hadith. Sufyan al-Thawri is, is of the third generation of the Muslims. He is a contemporary of Imam Malik and Imam al-Awza'i and all of these great Imams of fiqh. And he, was, he had a madhab. He had his own madhab. Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, he says, Ma'alashtu shay. I never struggled with anything that was more difficult for me than my niyyah. Why? It's always changing. And the Arabs say, وَمَا سُمِّيَ الْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا لِنَسِّهِ وَمَا سُمِّيَ الْقَلْبِ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ يتقلب. The only reason why the insan was called the insan is because of their nisyan. <coughs> is because of their nisyan. وَمَا سُمِّيَ الْقَلْبِ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ يتقلب. Nisyan means forgetfulness. 
And so the human being is tied to their forgetfulness. And the qalb was not called the qalb, the heart, except لِأَنَّهُ يَتَقَلَّبُ it is always turning and turning and turning and turning. And so a person reflecting on their intention and thinking about their intention should be something that's not a yearly activity. It's something that should be an hourly activity. What do I intend by the actions that I do? Number two. The second thing is being conscious of something that is very important. And that is الخطأ من طبيعة البشر That mistakes are part of the human experience and it's part of human nature. You are not going to have a person who is without mistakes. You are not going to have a person who is without sin. In fact, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Kullu bani Adam wa khayrul He says, every son of Adam, daughter of Adam, is a sinner. And the best of sinners are those who repent. And so recognizing when we correct people's behavior that I need to correct something today and correct something tomorrow and correct something the day after. Why? Because we walk with mistakes. And that I don't be frustrated by the amount of me having to engage people and correct people. That I don't be upset that I have to teach someone something once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times. Because people are prone to forgetfulness and people are prone to mistakes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amazed as the Prophet ﷺ tells us, Inna Allah ya'jabu min shabbin laysat lahu sabwa. Allah is amazed at a young person who doesn't commit mistakes. A young person who does not have an inclination towards their desires. And a young person, because a lot of our pressure and a lot of our frustration when it comes to mistakes is regarding young people. Well, the default with a young person, the default with human beings is that they make mistakes. But the default with regards to young people is that it's even more so that their mistakes are mistakes of passion. They're mistakes that have to do with hawa, that have to do with lust, that have to do with these types of emotions. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amazed at a young person who doesn't experience that. And it is so amazing, it is so rare, it is so unique, it is so special that we know that of the seven categories of people who are shaded in the, in the shade of the throne of Allah on the day of judgment, one of those categories is a young person who grows up worshipping Allah. So a young person who grows up on the straight and narrow they grew up at click, they never deviated anywhere, they grew up going to the masjid and, and memorizing Qur'an and they avoided all of the major sins as they were growing up. This person's actions are so special that on the day of judgment they will have access, they will have shade under the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day where there is no shade except for His shade. And so my point here being that we don't overreact in our frustration with regards to people's mistakes, especially with regards to young people. You know, I was making this argument. This might be a tangent, but with regards to extremism and how, you know, when we're talking about religious extremism, a lot of times, uh, you know, you fear from it, the vast majority of the times, you fear from it regarding young people. 19, 20, 21, 18, 17, right? That age range is really when you fear extremism. And so in a lot of programs all over the country, you have these programs of entrapment where the government will send people to go and talk to security apparatus or security agencies will go and they will send people to go and, 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 and talk to people and kind of lure them in to the terrorism cases. And so once uh, we were presenting on this issue, and we mentioned that extremism in young people is not something that's restricted to Muslim kids. Extremism walks with young people, period. Across the board, whether it's the 19-year-old kid who's doing 120 on the highway, isn't that a form of extremism? 
You're not doing that when you're 40. You're not doing that when you're 50, right? That feeling of immortality and that youthful impulse. What about uh, recklessness with regards to the usage of drugs? Don't you fear that for young people more than you fear that for elderly people? What about recklessness with regards to intimacy? I got my young man here, so I have to use euphemisms. But intimacy, right? Casual relationships. Isn't that something that you see more in young people than that you fear? And so youth work across the board deals with extremism. But it manifests in different ways with different demographics of people. And so what we do when we're, we're working with young people is not that we try to create young people who are not going to ever make mistakes because that is incredibly rare and it's, it's, it's rare for human beings, much less for young people. But we try to put our arms around them and protect them as much as possible that the mistakes that they make, which they are going to make, but the mistakes that they make are not ones that destroy their worldly life or their hereafter. That they are mistakes that are manageable. That they are mistakes that will not destroy them. And so recognizing number two, point number two, that mistakes walk with people and that they are a part of human, human nature. Number three is that the greater the sin, the more required a person must be in correcting them. The greater the sin. So what does that mean? The Prophet ﷺ was more quick to respond to mistakes that had to do with our theology. Mistakes that had to do with our aqidah. The Prophet ﷺ was very quick to correct those. So for example, on the day when his son Ibrahim, Ibrahim died. When Ibrahim died, anhu ardah, the Prophet ﷺ wept over him obviously. And he grieved very much at the death of Ibrahim. But there was also an eclipse in the sky. And so the people, they were so close to much of their kufr. Many of them were new Muslims. And they said, Allah is, or the heavens are grieving to the grief of Rasulullah The heavens are grieving with the grief of the Prophet and so the Prophet وسلم, he then summoned the people and he stood on the mimbar and he said, the sun and the moon, on that same day, in that same moment, he said, the sun and the moon are two signs from the signs of Allah. They do not eclipse for the birth or the death of anybody. And so the Prophet وسلم, immediately corrected this misconception. Another time a man comes to Rasulullah وسلم, and he says, Allahu wa shi'at. He says, whatever you wish, O Messenger of Allah and Allah. Whatever Allah wishes and you wish. And so the Prophet says to him, nidda? Did you make me an equal to Allah? Say, Masha Allah wahda. Say what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes alone. Right? So he's immediately correcting that idea that no, it's not what you wish and Allah wishes. Allah's wish and will overwhelms every human will. وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and there is nothing that you will, except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills it, the lords of the world. I.e., your will does not overpower the will of Allah ever. Also, number four is, and this is so important, being aware of your place as the corrector of behavior. Being aware of your place. A lot of times, obviously Rasulullah sallallahu commanded incredible authority with regards to his companions. They had so much reverence, they had so much love for him, that if the Prophet sallallahu told them to do something, they would do it immediately. And if he stopped them from doing something, they would stop doing it immediately. The Prophet sallallahu commanded that authority. Now you and I can't go and assume that we command that level of authority amongst people. You're not going to get the same response. And so for example, you have this hadith of Ya'ish ibn Tahfa al-Ghifari, who narrates from his father, who says that I was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and I was being hosted. 
He's saying I was being hosted in the masjid when the Prophet ﷺ was hosting companions who were poor. So he was shacking up in the masjid with other companions who were poor. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, فَخَرَجَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ فِي اللَّيْلِ يَتَعَاهَدْ ضَيْفَهُ The Prophet ﷺ came out in the, in the night. He was just checking up on all of his, his guests. فَرَآنِي مُنْبَطِحًا عَلَى بَطْنِي So he saw me laying down on my stomach. He saw me laying down on my stomach. فَرَكَضَنِي بِرِجْلِهِ So he kicked me with his foot. The Prophet ﷺ kicked him with his foot. And he said, do not lay down like that. This is a lying down that Allah hates. Okay? So this hadith is reported by Ahmed. And it's authenticated by Al-Albani. And it's controversial in its, in its authenticity. Al-Albani, rahimahullah, authenticated it. And that's why we have in our culture, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this, where you're not to lie down on your stomach. And like I said, the hadith is controversial in its authenticity. And that's why... Uh, you'll get different answers on this particular question. Is it allowed for you to lay down on your stomach? In any case, we have this incident. The Prophet ﷺ kicked this man. Obviously, he didn't kick him hard, but he kicked him. Nonetheless, does that mean that the next time you're in Ramadan and you see people making i'tikaf in the masjid, laying down on their stomachs, that you should walk up to them and kick them because that's sunnah? Most likely, if you walk up to somebody and kick them, you'll get more than a kickback, right? And then the answer is, well, how come I don't get the same level of, you're not the Prophet wasallam. And it is amazing to me how many people distance people from their religion because of this attitude. They think that everywhere where the Prophet wasallam was harsh, that they need to be harsh. Or every time they read an ather from a sahabi that they were harsh so that they should go and be harsh in the same way. So for example, there's a, a famous incident that's quoted a lot at least. I don't know how famous it is, but it's quoted a lot. Where Abdullah ibn Umar, a man came to Abdullah ibn Umar and he said, I love you for the sake of Allah. And so Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said to him, I hate you for the sake of Allah. The man says, I love you for the sake of Allah. Umar says, I hate you for the sake of Allah. And he says, why? He says, because you make your adhan like the, like the singing of singers. You make your adhan like the singing of singers. So I remember I was discussing this with one brother because this brother was starting to go down a path where he, was, he saw harshness as being like a, a pillar of the religion, of being harsh and severe against the Muslims and all of that. And I said, what are you doing? Is that what the Prophet ﷺ was like? And then he said, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, a man came to him and he said, I love you for the sake of Allah. And he said, I hate you for the sake of Allah because you make your adhan like the adhan. I said, okay, sit down for a second. Are you Ibn Umar? Do you command, do you know who Ibn Umar is? Ibn Umar is one of the five most prolific narrators of hadith. You know, in the stages of fiqh, of the development of this ummah, you have the time of the great companions, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, the times of expansion, right? And then when they died, who did the ummah look to to teach them? It was Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Umar and Aisha radiallahu anha and Anas ibn Malik. These people became teachers par excellence. These were masters who were looked at by the entire ummah and revered and followed for their scholarship. Ibn Umar is not nobody. Ibn Umar is one of the greatest scholars in the history of Islam. And so when he says something, keeping in mind his age as well, his seniority, when he says something, it's not like it's being said by some 23-year-old kid who can barely get through Juz'u Amma reciting it properly. It's not the same. Right? And so paying attention to these things. A father saying something to his son is not like you saying it to them. Recognizing your place. And it goes vice versa, obviously, as well. A lot of times, people who are young, they learn, right? They take a class here, they attend the masjid halaqa there, or not even just young, even elders. 
And then they want to go and teach a group of people that it's very hard to teach. And that group of people is your parents. The default with regards to parents is that you know nothing. That's the default. Not in the sense of you don't know anything, but it's very hard for you to convince your parents of anything. Why? Because at the end of the day, you're still a kid. They changed your diapers and they saw you grow up. You know Imam Abu Hanifa? And he's this great Imam of Fiqh, right? He's one of the four madahibs. And Shafi'i said, we are all dependent on Imam Abu Hanifa. May Allah have mercy on them all in Fiqh. Imam Abu Hanifa, in the famous story, his mom would ask him for a fatwa. But she wouldn't ask him. She would ask him to go and ask somebody else that she trusted. And so her son is Abu Hanifa. But she's like, I want you to go and ask this guy. And so Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu would go and ask. And then that man would have no clue what the answer was. And so he would say to the imam, what is the answer? What is your answer? So Imam Abu Hanifa would say to him, the answer is such and such and such and such. He'd say, tell your mom, that's my answer. And then he would go back. Right? This notion of being very, very difficult to take from your children. I remember there's a, another uh, sheikh who's very well known for tafsir of the Qur'an. Incredibly popular. Like when you think of tafsir, you probably, many people think of him first. My brother was telling me when you go and you visit him, his father is always handing people CDs of tafsir. And he tells them, listen to this sheikh, he's very good in tafsir. And he's always giving them somebody else. It's, it's never, he's never giving them the CDs of his actual son, who's like worldwide famous for his tafsir and stuff like that. He's like, no, my son doesn't know what he's talking about here. here right? So a lot of times you turn around and you're trying, to, you're trying to communicate this information to your parents and they're not listening or they don't, they don't respond in the way. So you're like, is my father arrogant? No, your father's not arrogant. It's just that coming from you, it's very hard. And so if a person is sincere, that's where the sincerity comes in. Remember we talked about it Hassan and Hussein last week. If a person is sincere, then it's not about me communicating that information to them. I don't care how they get the knowledge. I don't care how they get the guidance. I don't care how that da'wah pierces their heart as long as it does. And so whether it's me talking to my friend, right? Because then what I'm going to do is I'm going to seek out the best way for that information to be communicated to them. Maybe it's not through me. Fine. I surrender to that. But maybe I have an uncle who my father always listens to. Maybe there's a sheikh who my mom loves listening to. So I'm going to go and I'm going to find that particular video online somewhere. And I'm going to go and I'm going to make sure that she, we listen to it together or we watch it together. Right? So I maneuver my corrective behavior or I maneuver my method of correcting. I manipulate it to bring benefit to that person. Keeping in mind my place as well as theirs, my station as well as theirs, my age as well as theirs, all of these things. Number five, making a difference, differentiating between a person who makes a mistake while they are ignorant and a person who makes a mistake upon knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ would not treat the ignorant like he tro treated the knowledgeable companions. And so we all know the famous hadith, of the Bedouin who came into the message of the Prophet ﷺ and he simply started urinating. He didn't know any better. The Prophet ﷺ dealt with him very calmly. And the Prophet ﷺ simply, and there are two lessons actually that are, are learned here because I'm going to fast forward a little bit, but one of the other principles that, that we, we learn is that your fixing of the munkar, your correcting a person's mistakes cannot bring about bigger mistakes. I don't correct X if Y is going to be even worse. If it's going to bring it about, right? And we'll give examples. But one of the examples here is even in this. The Prophet ﷺ, when this man was urinating, he, the companions rushed. It was just an instinct. So they rushed to go and, 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 and stop him. But the Prophet ﷺ said, stop, leave him. Why? Because if it was, if, if this man gets interrupted in the middle of that action, then there's going to be either he's going to start moving around, in which case it'll even spread even more. The surface area will be even 
uh, bigger than the area that he was urinating it before, or some harm will come to him physically. So the, the harm will be bigger than the harm of him simply finishing in this moment. But the Prophet wasallam then corrected the man. He brought some water and he commanded it to be poured in the place of the, uh, of, of the, um, of the najasa. And then he told the man that the masajid are not for this. Another time, another companion who uh, tells a beautiful story, uh, Muawiyah ibn al-Hakam al-Sulami. He says he came to Medina fil Badia. He came to Medina from the desert. And he was praying behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he didn't know that speaking in the salah had become prohibited. And so while he was praying with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa a person sneezed. And so when that man sneezed, he's in salah and he said, Yarhamakullah. And so then he says, فَرَمَانِ الْقَوْمُ بِأَبْصَارِهِمْ So he said, everybody started looking at me. And so I then said to them, what's the matter with you guys? What are y'all looking at? Right? He has no clue that you can't speak in salah. And so he says, ما شأنكم تنظرون إليه? He says, why are y'all looking at me? And so, فجعلوا يضربون بأيديهم على أفقادهم. So they started slapping their thighs. They're like telling him, shut up, be quiet. So when I realized that they were basically indicating for me to be quiet, I was quiet. And then he said, when the salah was over, the Prophet ﷺ called him. He says, who was the one who was speaking? And so I said, me, O Messenger of Allah. So he says, Mu'awiyah, he says, فَبِأَبِي هُوَ وَأُمِّي مَا رَأَيْتُ مُعَلِّمًا قَبْلَهُ وَلَا بَعْدَهُ أَحْسَنَ مِنْ أَعْلَى أَحْسَنَ تَعْلِيمًا مِنْ He says, I never saw a teacher before him or after him who was a better teacher than him. He didn't hit me. And he didn't insult me. But he simply said, إِنَّ هَذِهِ الصَّلَاةَ لَا يَصْلِحُ فِيهَا شَيْءٌ مِّنْ كَلَامِ النَّاسِ إنما هو التسبيح والتكبير وقراءة القرآن. He simply said to him, this salah, this salah, nothing is to be undertaken in it of the speech of people. Nothing is to be said in it of the speech of people. It is simply for tasbih and takbir and the recitation of the Quran. Or you say Subhanallah or Subhan uh, Subhan Rabbi Al A'la, Subhan Rabbi Al Azim, right? Takbir or the recitation of the Quran. And so the Prophet ﷺ recognizing when a person was ignorant and teaching them, and he would teach them with calmness, and the Prophet ﷺ would teach them with a, a, in a way that made them feel welcome and not insulted. Also, differentiating between, <clears throat> and this is number six, differentiating between sins that sins in which a, uh, actually not differentiating, but realizing that a person, when they intend goodness, intending goodness is not the only requirement um, for reaching goodness. Intending goodness is not the only requirement for reaching goodness. A lot of times people do lots of different things and they just, if you ask them why are you doing this or don't do that, it's not from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet never did this. He never commanded to do it. They will respond to you and say, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Verily all actions are by intentions. I'm intending good. So as long as I'm intending good, then I'm good, right? That's the logic. But we said at the beginning that for an action to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has to fulfill two requirements. The first requirement is that it has to be done specific, it has to be done sincerely for Allah. And the second requirement is that it has to be in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet. And so, Ad Darimi reports that Abu Musa al Ash'ari came to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is also, remember, we talked about Aisha and Anas ibn Malik and Abdullah ibn Umar. You add Abdullah ibn Mas'ud into that category of young Sahaba who became entire schools. 
who the entire ummah came to and studied from and learned from. You know, uh, in the science of Qur'an, you've got three schools from the schools of the Sahaba. You have the school of Ubay ibn Ka'b in Medina. So this is, again, the early Sahaba, they were very busy with the empire itself, establishing the religion. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu with the, with the Hurub al-Ridda, Umar ibn Khattab with Persia and Asham and Al-Iraq and Egypt. You have Uthman ibn Affan and Ali ibn Abi Talib with the Khawarij. That's why you, and they didn't live that long after the Prophet wasallam. But when the Ummah became stable, that is when the Sahaba were relegated to the, te- the role of teachers. Or the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were teachers. I won't say relegated, that's not really respectful for them. But they were teachers. And people would come to them to learn from them. So you have like full-time students and you had schools that began to be founded. And so you have the school of Ubay ibn Ka'b in Medina. And that school was focused on the maghazi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The, the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it's appropriate that it's in Medina. And then you have the school of Abdullah ibn Abbas in Mecca. Abdullah ibn Abbas, the young cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who the Prophet prayed that he be given the ability to interpret the Qur'an. And his story is a beautiful one, and he became one of the greatest scholars in the history of the Ummah. And Abdullah ibn Abbas' school is in Mecca. And a lot of their tafsir is with regards to the language of the Qur'an and what have you. And then you have the third school, which is the school of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, which is in Al-Kufa in Iraq. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud's school, uh, a lot of it, I would say there's a lot of fiqh in that school of tafsir. In any case, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is in Al-Kufa. And Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, another great companion of the Prophet sallallahu comes to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And he says, I saw something in the masjid that I didn't want to criticize until I came to you. But I don't know if, I don't see anything but good. And then Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says to him, well, what is it? And he, they go to the masjid, the masjid of Al-Kufa. And back in those days, of course, there's only one masjid in a city. There's only one masjid. And so they go, and what do they find? They find a group of people who are sitting in a circle. And there's one person who has some pebbles. And he takes a pebble and he throws it into the middle of the circle. And so they're building up a pile. And every time he throws a pebble, he says, سَبِّحُ مِئَةً Say subhanallah a hundred times. And so they say, subhanallah, 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 subhanallah. And so they do that. Halilumia, say la ilaha illallah a hundred times, like that. La ilaha illallah. Kabrumia, say it, right? And so Abdullah ibn Mas'ud walks into their group and he kicks the pebbles. And then he says to them a simple statement. He says, either you are more guided than the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or you are opening up a door of misguidance. It's one of these two. Either you are more guided than the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or you are opening up a door of misguidance. And then they said, Ya Aba Abdurrahman, Ma aradna illa khayra. Oh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, we didn't intend anything except for good. And then Abdullah, because why does he say you are either more guided than the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi or you're opening up a, a door of misguidance? Why does he say that? Because if it is something that, if it was something that was from the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the companions would have done it. It's as simple as that. For you to do something that the companions didn't do, Either you are more guided than they are, you are basically saying you have access to information that they didn't have, you have access to a goodness that they didn't know, or you are opening up a door of misguidance because you are doing something that they didn't do, or you are doing something that hasn't been legislated by the religion. And so they said, oh Abu Abdurrahman, we only intended good. And then he says, 
how many people intend good but don't reach it? How many people intend good but they never reach it? قَالَ وَكَمْ مِنْ مُرِيدٍ لِلْخَيْرِ لَمْ يُصِبْهُ إِنَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ And then he says, the Prophet صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ He told us, حَدَّثَنَا أَنَّ قَوْمًا يَقْرَؤُونَ الْقُرْآنَ لَا يُجَاوِزُ تُرَاقِيهِمْ He says, I see, or the Prophet صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ He says that there will be a people who will recite the Qur'an. It will not reach, go beyond their throats. And I don't know, maybe most of you are from them. And then he turned away from them. So Amr ibn Salama, he says, I saw the majority of these people on the day of Nahrawan ma'al khawarij. On the day of the battle between the khawarij and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he says, I saw the majority of those guys who were sitting in that group, I saw them with the khawarij. Because that was, they took up a methodology that was wrong from the get-go. They saw themselves as being more guided than the guidance of the Prophet wasallam, Or more precise, let us say, that they didn't feel the need to restrict themselves to the guidance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the guidance that came with the companions of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So I don't know what no number we're on here, but I think we're on number eight. So number eight is being just with regards to correction. Meaning that you are just, and this is very rare in people, you are just as willing to criticize the one who is beloved to you and near you and respectful, respected to you as you are willing to correct the behavior of the far and the distant and the opponent and the one who, I guess, is on a, you know, a, a different uh, shade of the religion from you. A lot of people are very willing to, critic, to criticize the far. They are willing to correct the far. But when the close and the beloved to them do anything wrong, they overlook it. They overlook it. And so the Prophet wasallam, famous incident, a wealthy woman had committed theft. She was wealthy. And it was, it, was, it was going to be very, very, uh, it was a very awkward situation for them. Are they going to punish her with the head punishment? And so they sent someone who was incredibly beloved to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to go speak on, on their behalf. They sent Usama ibn Zayd. Usama is the son of Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd was the adopted son of Rasulullah So Usama is like the grandson of the Prophet That's how much he is the beloved, the son of the beloved of Rasulullah Remember Zayd ibn Haritha for a long time, he was literally called Zayd ibn Muhammad. The Prophet adopted him. And it wasn't until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses in Surah Al-Ahzab, ادعوهم لآبائهم Call them, by, call them to their fathers. It is better that the name switched from Zayd ibn Muhammad to Zayd ibn Harith, to his, his real father's name. Usama is, comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then he comes to intercede on behalf of this woman. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asks Usama, he says, Atashfa fi haddin min hududillah? Are you interceding on behalf of a of a had of a a a, uh, a prescribed punishment or a limit of the limitations of Allah? And then Usama says, "Astaghfir li, Rasulullah." Immediately, Usama kind of recognizes that he's in the deep end, and so he says, "Seek forgiveness for me, O Messenger of Allah." The Prophet وسلم, then got a, a, he got up and he gave a khutbah amongst the people. And he says, And That what destroyed, in his khutbah, he says, the thing that destroyed the people before you 
is that when the sharif, the honored, the noble, would commit a crime, they would be forgiven or they would be left alone. And when the poor would commit a crime, aqamu alayhi al they would punish them. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Aqamu alayhi al Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ By the one in whose hand is my soul. Lo Fatima. If Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, stole, I would cut off her hand. Consistency in correcting people's behavior. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, if, and by the way, just a random Arabic tangent. There's different ways that you say if in Arabic. There's lo, idha, and in. In, idha, and lo. So you could say, in, uh, in sariqat, in sariqat Fatima bintu Muhammad. Ida sariqat Fatima bintu Muhammad. Lo sariqat Fatima bintu Muhammad. All of those work. But what's the difference? Lo is used for something that is not probable. Lo is used for something that's, that's not realistic. You, it's not expected to happen. And so the Prophet sallam, says, Lo sariqat Fatima bintu Muhammad. Why does he say lo here? Because it's not, Fatima is not going to steal. That's not, that's not something that would happen, right? As opposed to idha, which is something that is likely or something that's more likely at least. And so the Prophet ﷺ says, what destroyed the people before you? And so here we learn something, that this is a cause of a halak of an ummah. That whenever the people who are the wealthy and the noble when those people are left alone and the people who are poor and downtrodden without any resources, those people are punished, that is an ummah that is up to be destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in another beautiful hadith that's reported by Ibn Majah, the Prophet وسلم, he asked a group of people who had come back from Abyssinia. So the people of Abyssinia, they had migrated way back during the time of Mecca. But they came back in the seventh year of the Hijrah. So you're talking about Khaybar that year when the Ummah had the, the, the city of Medina had been established and strengthened. These people came back finally. They'd been there for almost, if not a decade, in Ethiopia. So the Prophet ﷺ asked them and he said, What was the most amazing thing that you saw in Al Habasha? In Abyssinia. And so one person said, the most amazing thing that we saw was a nun that was walking down the street and she was carrying a vessel of water on her head. And a young man came up from behind her and he pushed her until she fell. So just some punk kid walks up behind this old lady and he pushes her until she falls. And so the lady then got up. And she said, you will come to know, O traitor, that on the day of judgment, when Allah sets up the kursi or the footstool, and the hands and feet speak about what they used to earn, you will come to know about this affair between you and me very soon. And so the Prophet وسلم, then comments and he says, Sadaqat, Sadaqat. She has spoken the truth. She's spoken the truth. And then he says, كَيْفَ يُقَدِّسُ اللَّهُ أُمَّةً لَا يُؤْخَذْ لِضَعِيفِهِمْ مِنْ شَدِيدِهِمْ أو كَيْفَ يُقَدِّسُ اللَّهُ قَوْمًا لَا يُؤْخَذْ لِضَعِيفِهِمْ مِنْ شَدِيدِهِمْ He says, how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor an ummah where the poor are not given the resource to secure their rights from the strong? How can Allah secure or give... Uh, how can Allah give tawfiq or blessing to an ummah where the poor do not have the recourse to secure their right from the strong. Hold on. You want to make the other one? Go ahead. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. 
اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان محمد رسول الله اشهد ان محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاه حي على الصلاه حي على الفنا حي على الفنا الله اكبر الله اكبر لا اله الا Alhamdulillah, salatu salam ala rasulillah. So we mentioned the last two. I believe this is number eight. That I, number nine. Okay, so number nine. So a person is that a person be cautious that their correcting of the munkar not lead to a bigger munkar. Their correcting of a mistake not lead to a bigger mistake. So for example. Well, let's go to the Prophet ﷺ first. The Prophet ﷺ in Bukhari, he tells Aisha. And he says, if it were not for that your people are hadithu ahdin bi kufr, your people are new Muslims, I would have placed the Kaaba back on the foundation of Ibrahim. So you know the Kaaba isn't supposed to be a perfect square like it is right now. It's not supposed to be a square. During the time of the Prophet ﷺ, Ibrahim ﷺ, when he built it, it's a, rect it's a rectangular shape. And then, during the time of Rasulullah ﷺ, when he was a young man, he was around 35, there was a flood that happened in Mecca, and much of the Kaaba was damaged, they rebuilt it. And when they rebuilt it, they said that they were not going to use money that came from two sources. Number one, from prostitution, and number two, from interest. And so they actually came up short in their funding. They couldn't construct the whole thing as it used to be. So what they did was they shortened it and they made it into the square shape that it is now. And that's why you have that, that uh, semicircle structure on the end of it indicating that this is actually part of the Kaaba. It's part of the Kaaba. So when, if you hop over that little uh, wall there, you can't do it. But I've seen some people, they actually are able to get through. But they'll move you out or what have you. But you're technically inside the Kaaba, right? And if you're in the Kaaba, then you can pray in whatever direction that you want. But in any case, even though everybody who's in there, they'd pray towards the Kaaba just because you don't want to be weird. But the Prophet ﷺ tells Aisha, he says, if it wasn't for the fact that your people are close to Kufur. So what is he basically saying? He's saying that the, the way that the Kaaba is, it needs to be corrected. It is a munka. However... For me to fix it at this point in time, you're, you're literally talking about, uh, you know, two years after the conquest of Mecca. The people are still very, very new to this. And if you go and you change something that their hearts have become attached to, and this is something that's customary, and you're talking about 30 years they've been in this scenario, they might revolt, they might return back to their kufur. And that's a bigger munkar than the Kaaba being like it is. And so... Years later, decades later, Abdullah ibn Zubair, after the death of Ali ibn Abi Talib and the death of Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein, radiallahu ajma'in, Abdullah ibn Zubair declares himself the Khalifa and he receives bay'ah in Mecca and Medina. And he is being challenged by Abdul Malik ibn Marwan in Al-Sham, the Umayyads. 
And so Abdul, Abdullah ibn Zubair, the great companion of the Prophet wasallam, he's one of the young companions obviously because he lived a very long time afterwards and he was the first companion to be born in Medina after they had all migrated. Abdullah ibn Zubair, his logic is that this khalas, the, the ummah has gotten used to it and if you were to change the Kaaba now, they wouldn't revolt. They've been Muslim for a long time. Their iman is fast. It's steadfast at least. And so he extends the Kaaba and he makes it upon the foundation of Ibrahim. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, the Umayyad Khalifa, kills Ab Abdullah ibn Zubair. His general, Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, crucifies Abdullah ibn Zubair. And when Abdul Malik ibn Marwan seizes control over Mecca and Medina, he then returns the Kaaba back to how it used to be. Just because Abdullah ibn Zubair did it. So now we're going to return it how it used to be. So then the Umayyads last for however long they last, and then the Abbasids take over from the Umayyads, the next dynasty. And so Harun al Rashid, he asks Imam Malik, and he says to him, because now the Kaaba is back in its square, its square form. He says, shouldn't we now extend the Kaaba to the foundation of Ibrahim like it used to be? And Imam Malik responds to him with a response that the Ummah has adopted ever since. He says, I do not want the house of Allah to become the playground of kings. Every time this king takes over from this one, this guy extends the Kaaba, this guy makes it smaller. This guy makes it larger, right? It becomes symbolic of each king's kingship. I don't want the house of Allah to become the playground of kings. And so he left it like that, and it's been like that ever since. So the munkar, a person can't correct the munkar by bringing forth a bigger munkar. You have a guy, for example, very religious, and he has to go to a party, or he has to go to a wedding, because it's his sister's wedding. And so he has to go. And so he goes and there's going to be music and dancing and all that type of stuff. And so he decides, you know what, this is, that's a huge munkar. I'm going to go and I'm going to destroy this munkar. So he goes up on stage and he breaks the drums and he breaks this and he breaks that. Okay, you've uh, removed the munkar, right? But most likely you've now brought forth a bigger munkar. You'll have people who sit there and and curse uh, religiosity and religious people and maybe even the religious itself, the religion itself. And so now what you've done is you've introduced them and you've exposed them to possibly committing a bigger munkar than before. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So that is making sure that the munkar that you do does not bring forth a bigger munkar. You know, there's a, also a famous example of this, Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al-Islam. He was walking by some of the Tatar, the Mongols. And these Mongols were drunk out of their minds. Completely drunk. And he just walked by them. And so somebody said to him, Shaykh al-Islam, he said, you know, Oh Imam, shouldn't we correct this munka? Shouldn't we tell these guys that drinking is haram? They're Muslim now. Shouldn't we tell them that drinking is haram and they shouldn't do that and stuff like that? Shouldn't we correct that? And he said to them, leave them alone. When they are sober, they kill us. When they're sober, they kill us and they take our properties and we'd rather that they just be drunk like this. Right? Because my commanding of the munka here is going to bring rise to a bigger munka. And then the last one. Is knowing the difference between a mistake that has to do or transgressing your own personal limits and transgressing the limits of Allah. How we should be and how the Prophet ﷺ was, was that he wouldn't be ever uh, bothered or he was very forbearant, let's say. He was very forbearing with any injury that had to do with his own person. Somebody insulted him, he was forbearing. Somebody harmed him physically, he was forbearing. But when would he be angered? He would be angered when the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were crossed. He was very forbearing with regards to his own self. He was very uh, gentle and understanding in his dealing with people as they interacted with him many times in very inappropriate ways. 
the Prophet ﷺ was once wearing a, a cloak. He was wearing a cloak, a burda, that was very thick. Very thick. And so this Bedouin comes up to him, grabs him by his cloak, and pulls him on it very harshly. And the companion says, I saw the trace of the cloak on the skin of the Prophet ﷺ. This person is making a mark on Rasulullah by how hard he's pulling him. He's a very harsh Bedouin. And then he says to him, and he says, Ya Muhammad, murli min marillahi alladhi indak. He says, Oh Muhammad, give me from the wealth of Allah that's with you. So he's calling him by Muhammad. Very disrespectful. Even Allah never calls Rasulullah Muhammad in the Quran. Never. It's always, Ya ayyuhal Nabi, Ya ayyuhal Rasul. He never directly calls him and he says, Ya Muhammad, never in the Quran. Even though Allah says that about every other prophet. Ya Adam, askun anta wa jannah. Ya Nuh, Ya Zakaria, Ya Isa. All of this. Inni mutawfiq wa rafi'uka ilayya. All of this is in the Quran. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, never. And so this Bedouin is coming to him and he's, even his wives will call him Ya Rasulullah. And yet this man, he comes and he says, O oh Muhammad, give me from the wealth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And so the Prophet ﷺ, all that did was made him smile. He simply smiled. فَالْتَفَتَ إِلَيْهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وسلم, ثُمَّ ضَحِكَ ثُمَّ أَمْرَ لَهُ بِعَطَى The Prophet ﷺ turned to him and then he laughed. And then he commanded for him to have some wealth distributed to him. We are responsible. And we are required. And we should be angered when the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are transgressed. A person should be more upset that something haram is done than be upset that someone's feelings were hurt. A person should be more upset that something haram was done than a person be upset that someone didn't take some sort of you know, sensitivity into consideration. You know, there's a, a, a video, and I'll end with this. There's a video that's gone viral this past week. And it's about some young Muslims who are trying to do something for their identity and their religion. And I have a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of depth to it. But in general, their organization, what they do is they, is they you would say, you would say they're, they're not, uh, what should I say? It's mimicking the party scene. Okay, they've got a DJ and they have non-alcoholic drinks and they have, Dancing pretty much and you know So a lot of the criticism that you found online for this Was actually that a lot the vast majority of the criticism had nothing to do with halal and haram it Had nothing to do with you know, this is haram you need to fear a lot stuff like that. It was about demographics and it was about How come you haven't included more black people into this pro into this program? Why is it Arabs and, you know, Desis who are wealthy? Why? And so my argument against that was, okay, if there was a lot of black people, would everybody be okay with that? Right? Are we more upset about these things, you know, um, these liberal values as opposed to the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being transgressed? And in reality, you'll find that, that the vast majority of people, that no matter what haram is done, they're fine with it. But if it's liberal values that are crossed, if it's something like racism, if it's something like patriarchy, if it's like these types of things, then the dunya tqum wa la Everybody gets upset and they're willing to build the, to, 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 to pound the drums of war. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his guidance and his forgiveness. Aqulu ma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam 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 wa s